welcome to Open Source Bridge. Thank you, Rob, for providing that wonderful music to get us going. Year four. How many of you are here? We're welcome. We're happy to see your smiling faces once again. So, how many of you? Uh, how many? For how many of you is this your first year? Yay! Awesome. How many of you? How many have been here two years? How about three? Four? Awesome. We love all of you. So, as you know, this is, or maybe you don't know, but this is a completely 100% volunteer-run conference. Um, and we couldn't do this without all of the speakers who come and uh, share their knowledge with the volunteers who schlep pastries around and run errands and uh, may help you get you where you need to go. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Give yourself a round of applause for making this happen. So all of you who are here are open source citizens. And we just, I just want to take a quick moment to talk about that a little bit. Reed and I, Reed and I are the co-chairs, by the way. I think I forgot to say who we were. Um, but uh, we have kind of a sense of what open source citizenship means to us. But we realize we've never really asked you what it means to you. And I want to know that this year. So um, think about this throughout the week. When you sort of have a response, let us know on Twitter, uh, at open source, open source Bridge. Oh, that's right. Open Source Bridge. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's Bridge. Um, it's a good thing I have a co-chair. Uh, and yes, OSB12 is a hashtag, but the Twitter handle is OSB. Okay. No, OS Bridge. OS Bridge. Oh, OK. You know, I think it's time for me to stop talking about Twitter, actually, um, before I turn even redder. So do that tweet thing that I just talked about. And also, while you're thinking about that, once again, as we did last year, we're going to have an Open Source Citizen Award. And we're going to have a form up online where you can nominate people, preferably who people, are we saying it is people who are here at the conference? I think so. I think that's the requirement. So someone who's here at the conference that you know has really made an impact in the open source community. And you'll be able to nominate them. We're going to tweet out a link to the form, and we'll also have it posted at registration. So today, uh, today we have a great keynote coming up here in just a few minutes. Uh, this morning, we're going to do um, a set of long form sessions, and we're going to have a great lunch from Los Gorditos today. And then this evening, we are kicking things off in our hacker lounge with kind of this community project night. So we're highlighting a number of open source projects that are going to have tables and going to be doing some collaborative work this evening. We're going to be serving snacks and beer and things like that. It should be a great kind of kickoff to the week. Um, for those of you not familiar with it, our hacker lounges are kind of space for uh, collaboration and community building and talking to people and being social and all of that. And it is over in that main uh, reception hall near registration where you first came in. Um, we're really excited to have that again. Um, we are, like last year, selling interesting merchandise. Uh, this year we have new shiny full color shirts. They have three colors instead of one. Um, <laughs> and exciting things like that. Um, just so that people know some interesting things to get sort of the most out of their week and manage their schedule and things like that, on our conference website, you can mark things as favorites by clicking on that little star icon down there. And um, is this a laser? It is a laser. Star icon. Um, by clicking on that little star icon, you can mark things as favorites. And then you can download uh, like an ICS iCalendar file of your favorites, or you can view them all, which is very handy for kind of keeping track of what you're actually interested in going to see. We have an Android app. Uh, if you search for it on the Google Android store, you will find two of them. One of them is labeled Open Source Bridge 2012, and that's the one for this year. The, um, another interesting thing on the website, there's this little session notes link on each of the session pages, which will take you to the dedicated wiki page for session notes for that session. We encourage you to take, set, take notes. We even encourage speakers to try to coerce people into being designated note takers um, so that people can document what they're learning and keep that around. And as we mentioned earlier, our conference hashtag is OSB12. 
if you post things on photo sharing sites and things like that, uh, tag it with OSP12 or and or OS Bridge. And um, we are, as Christy mentioned earlier, an all volunteer run event. And so, as that is the case, all of our volunteers, if you need anything, can be found by looking for people in these lovely bright green shirts. I can see several of those out here in the audience now. Um, also, we do still have some volunteer shifts open, so if you happen to have some extra time and want to help out, uh, talk to people at the registration desk and we can find you some volunteer shifts. Sponsors, I just want to take a quick moment to thank Intel, Engine Yard, Google, and RentTrack for their support of the conference. We can't, we can't put on this event without our sponsors, so thank you. And I have some additional sponsors there as well. Next, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker. Sumana is an experienced speaker, manager of people and projects. Currently, she works at Wikimedia Foundation as an engineering community manager. She blogs at Geek Feminism, is an advisory board member at the Ada Initiative, and has a master's in tech management from Columbia University. Welcome, Sumana. Thank you. Welcome to today's sermon. <laughs> I want to tell you a story. I am Sumana Harihadeshwara. I am a successful open source contributor. I've done testing, documentation, marketing, and community management for several projects. And I learned how to do community management before I knew what it was called. My parents came to the US from Karnataka in South India in the 1970s. They spoke Kannada, and they arrived in Oklahoma. And they found they were about as lonesome as a Linux user in Redmond. And they saw that the Kannada-speaking diaspora wanted to talk to each other, but couldn't. And so they made that happen. Well, how do you get Kannada speakers together in the late 1970s? Uh, Kannada Kuta. Local, local organizations, like user groups. Uh, Kuta means meeting. And they basically started a grassroots network of Kannada speaker meetups. Does this sound familiar? And well, how do we get these folks talking to each other all across North America? Well, they started a bi-monthly magazine called Americanada. <laughs> and they ran it for seven and a half years, a bi-monthly magazine in the 80s, uh, until their money and energy ran out. And it had great fiction, it had articles from those literary magazines back home in Mysore and Bangalore. And it included ads for those Kannadakuta meetups and how I started a Kannadakuta articles and tutorial exercises so you could teach Kannada to your kids in America. And I helped staple them and stamp the envelopes. One of the greatest gifts that you can give your children your employees, the people to whom you are a role model, is the knowledge that some field of endeavor is, in a sense, no big deal. Knowledge, belief backed up by experience, that they can do interesting and rewarding projects in it without fear of public embarrassment, because they've done it. And I grew up thinking that writing, editing, publishing, public speaking, and community leadership were no big deal. I use these lessons in my open source work all the time. We know how to do this. It's the standard best practices. It's due diligence, documentation, gardening your wiki, well-run events like this, and responding to people who show up, having those entry-level jobs for the newbies, not putting up with sexism or racism or jerkitude. And I treat my own attempts like no big deal, but compassion demands that I recognize my privilege and help other people build their skills and their confidence. But all that writing and editing stuff was a hobby for my parents. My mom told me, well, it doesn't work to try to make money at what you love, because you'll get sick of it. So instead, you should get a good job doing something else, and then have your hobby on the side. Music, writing, something like that. They wanted me to be a doctor, or an engineer, or maybe a lawyer, uh, preferably going into a government job because government jobs are safe, 
and stable. Remember, I mean, from when they were growing up really poor, like, of course they believed this, this was the best way. They grew up pretty damn poor. And then while I was growing up, my dad got laid off a few times, and that was tough for us. They wanted better for me. And I was pretty interested in programming. My dad and I did some basic programming. And I do mean basic, GW basic. <laughs> like go to considered my childhood. <laughs> so, you know, they thought that for sure, she will be an engineer. But I didn't feel like I could play around with that family computer and break it. It wasn't mine to break. And they wanted me to learn to program, for real. That sounded interesting. So they had an uncle come over and tutor me in Power Builder, the language of the future. <laughs> So, you know, instead of messing around with a computer and learning on my own, my parents thought of a very structured, hierarchical, uncle-based approach. <laughs> and another way to put this is, whenever my parents left me alone in the house, even when I was 16 and a senior in high school, my dad would say, don't do anything bold. He meant don't burn the house down. He meant safety first. But now I work for Wikipedia, where one of our mottos is, be bold. Edit that, Ricky, edit that page, take that risk. And it can be pretty tough to learn and decide that free is better than safe. And I was lucky. I had the privilege of growing up in the US, so even though my family was stability-oriented, wanted me to achieve traditional success, I had a more independence-oriented mass media surrounding me. Um, I had an educational system that uh, encouraged independent research projects. I went to a US university where I met hippies. This is very important. <laughs> um, it's even harder for some other folks, folks trying to get into our community, because they might still live at home till they get married, so their parents' doubts will still influence them. They might not have time because they have to do a lot of babysitting. And they might have no teachers who encourage critical thinking, just memorization. So they might believe that their time is not their own to spend and that their risks are not their own to take. And in all sorts of wikis, all sorts of places, we, like in wikis, and filing a bug, sending a post to a mailing list, spending your free time learning something that isn't on the curriculum, instead of studying, we ask people to take risks, to make choices that expose them to risk, risk of public mistakes, risk of ridicule, risk of doing worse in school. And to this day, I do have a lot of anxiety about messing up, about wasting things. And there's that voice that tells me, with the best of intentions, that safe is better than free. And I, I think about how this applies to open source especially when we talk about trying to get more global and gender diversity in our projects, when you do outreach, help these kids fight their parents. <laughs> of course, we don't want actual fights. We want to help kids persuade their parents. We want to help their parents understand that we're legit and that this hobby is worthwhile. You know, honestly, strong brand names like Google and Wikipedia are part of how you do that. Um, teach this stuff in schools so the parents trust that it's a real thing. And what's more, help make up for schools that don't promote creativity. And meet folks halfway with those structured tutorials and internships and the trappings that they're used to. And then once they start trusting you, you can show them how to think in terms of abundance instead of scarcity. You can show them how vulnerability, public bug reports, questions on IRC, playfulness in general, vulnerability is actually strength. My parents wanted me to be safe, not vulnerable, and that's one reason they were really overprotective when it came to boys. My friendship with Levi Tinney probably would have been my gateway into software development. He was this guy at my bus stop who was one grade above me. And he was the one who slipped me a copy of Wolfenstein 3D. <laughs> but would I have been allowed to hang out with Levi, to invite him over, go over to his place? Absolutely not. Inconceivable, he's a boy. And of course, my parents believed this. In their experience, the only kinds of men and boys who want to hang out alone with unmarried girls are dangerous, and only bad can come of it. My parents were specifically protecting me from sexual violence. 
and they had to be careful, better safe than sorry. This was not just about you need to concentrate on your studies. This was a fear based in their experience growing up that I would get harassed, assaulted, or raped. And I run into this fear in our open source work, and it's one of the barriers we have to address. We have to provide friendly, random, low-key social time for people who want to get into our community. And it is really worthwhile to work towards diversity in who's going to be there so that that girl, that 16-year-old that girl, can say, it's fine, Mom, there's going to be other girls there. It's fine. We, we want to meet people halfway, show them that they are wanted, that we want to engage with them, like going to FOSS.in, the software conference in Bangalore for free software, going to uh, a, a, a women in tech conference like Grace Hopper, having a, uh, perhaps, we really want women to write for this issue, uh, issue of your magazine. That's how I got into Gnome Journal. Gnome Journal had one issue one month where they said, we would love all these articles to be written by women. I was like, oh, I think I have an idea for that. Do what Myron Duffy did, run a class with the Girl Scouts, teach them Inkscape. And we do have to stand behind our words and stand against harassment and assault when they happen in our communities. Four words, geek feminism, Ada initiative. <laughs> and we have to provide ways for people who have never heard of open source to hear about us and our role models, including our female role models, and hang out with them and learn with them because you can't admire or learn what you can't see. And people do want to learn. And if you love what you do, then you want to teach it to people who want to learn. My, my late father was a Hindu priest. I guess this comes naturally to me. Um, <laughs> now, on weekdays, he was a civil engineer. But on weekends, dad performed pujas, Hindu religious rituals, like weddings, housewarmings, baby naming ceremonies. And he wanted participants to know what the rituals and Sanskrit mantras, the chants, meant. So he would write up these, these articles, these little programs in Hindi and Kannada and English. You know, he'd explain and what we were doing, the Sanskrit chants, then a transliteration into Kannada and Roman characters, and translation into English, some background, some history, theology, comparative religion. And then he would typeset them in Microsoft Word on the 486 running Windows 3.1 and run off 200 copies of the Office Depot, and I copy edited and stapled them. Stapling seems to be a theme here. And for a lot of people, I'm sure it was really TLDR. <laughs> but for my colleagues in the audience, now you know where my taste for documentation comes from. <laughs> it is not enough that people just repeat, Om Shuklam Bardaram, or for that matter, Git Push Origin Master. <laughs> they have to understand why we need to why. And no matter what you're teaching or leading, even if you are literally a priest in sacred clothes, you show people what they're doing and why they're doing it. Empowerment is kind of like turtles. It goes all the way down. <laughs> and dad was totally fine with me endlessly asking why about the origin of the Satya Narayana ritual. But I didn't get enough time and space quite to geek out on stuff like that on my own. It was expected that, like, of course, you want to spend most of your free time in public spaces of the house with your family around. <laughs> and they understood the idea of getting into the zone regarding writing. It was obvious you're making something. And both my parents were writers, so they got that. But fiddling around on the computer just seemed like time wasting to them. They let me do it some, play video games, explore the web, ill advised ventures onto Usenet that are still up under my name. <laughs> Um, but it certainly wasn't something they considered edifying. In general, I didn't get a lot of privacy or sustained time to just do my own thing. Or did I? Because, see, I remember not having enough, but my sister remembers me constantly doing my own thing, holed up in my room, not wanting to talk to anyone. Um, and the truth is probably both, that I had a lot and it wasn't enough because I was a strange, weird, obsessive kid. Not that any of you were as well. <laughs> um, and of course, they were socializing us 
me and my, uh, my parents were socializing, me and my sister trying to teach us to be social. From their experience, it was crucially important that their children be able to get along easily with nearly everyone. Meetings, dinners, interpersonal relationships, being liked are how people decide everything, right? In 1996, my parents would not have understood what we're up to. They trusted their friends and their families. They trusted school. And they thought they knew best for me. They believed they were giving me a lot of freedom. They did. But it was along the lines of which school clubs will you belong to? It's like that old joke. We, both, we got both kinds of music here, country and western. <laughs> um, if you think you're not in charge of your own life, you're going to do what your parents say. And that's not going to be lurk and hash drupal. So how can we fight this? I mean, this might be the hardest thing to fight that I've mentioned this morning. Maybe you can start by giving them that tiny, tiny task that they can start with, that first free taste, so that even if they're on manager time rather than maker time, you know, they can still get started. The biggest thing that gave me the confidence to start contributing, and this was nine years after I'd heard of Linux and started using it, the Participatory Culture Foundation had this really clear page on their site, how to test Miro. I wanted to learn. I wanted to geek out. So I started learning how to test Miro. I started filing bugs. And that was in 2007. And here I am five years later. So you can see how I feel bittersweet about all this. I was born in the US to these awesome, brilliant, community-building parents. These were Indians who had daughters and were happy about it. That's a big deal. They wanted their daughters to get excellent educations and be able to stay on their own two feet. My parents were really comparatively very good, and I'm one of the people who actually made it into open source and open culture. I work for Wikipedia. I told my mom this when I got hired. Immediately had to say, no, that's WikiLeaks. <laughs> This is my one plug. Yes, the Wikimedia Foundation is hiring developers just like everybody else. Come talk to me. <laughs> but my parents had a streak of conservatism that they could not see. And they were constrained by money. You know, we weren't rich enough to buy me a 486 to break, um, by our fears, as I've talked about, and by just not knowing about opportunities. So when you're talking on, on IRC or in person to a teenager, who's just starting to get into open source and open culture. Remember that on the other side, in their home at the kitchen table, they're going to hear messages like, but how is that going to get you a job? This is not going to help us find you a husband. But you need to be careful doing things like this on the internet, letting everyone see your name. That could be dangerous. You have time to do that, and you don't have time to come to the temple? You don't really need that computer, do you? Your cousin needs it. So we have to be able to answer those questions. And here are some ways to bootstrap the answers. What is no big deal to them, and what is an intimidatingly big deal? Have they grown up thinking safe is better than free? If their parents think our environment is unsafe, can we prove them wrong? Are we demystifying our processes, or is it all Sanskrit to them? And how can we help them get more maker time or contribute in the little time they have? So this is my origin story as an open source and open culture contributor, my anxieties and my skills. And there are no accidents. There are no miracles. Everything is caused. And seeing that causation, seeing the connection between what someone's doing now and all the causation that went before it, that's empathy. And it's a little like reverse engineering, except you're not trying to solve the other person. You're trying to unlock the DRM that's stopping them from solving cool problems with us. <laughs> I am asking you for something weird, something that might sound contradictory at first. Because when you think about the word empathy, and you think about the word discipline, they might seem like opposites. But I ask you to exercise a disciplined empathy. 
I ask you to not just use your empathy when a friend of yours is going through a tough time. I ask you to think, where are you coming from when that wannabe Summer of Code student pokes into IRC and asks for directions because they're too scared to poke around for themselves? I'm asking you, I'm asking you for the kind of hospitality that my parents showed newbies, new arrivals, who showed up at our house, sometimes on zero notice. You know, sometimes my parents were a little tired <laughs> from raising two kids and working jobs and making a magazine. But this work of hospitality and of disciplined empathy is how we get to a more perfect union. Thank you. <laughs>